Hi guys and welcome. I am so excited today to share with you the first episode of a new series uh, that I call the Wonderful Conversation series and where I'm going to have the chance to chat with really, really cool people about their life, about what they see, about their experience to kind of have a glimpse on who we really are and how life works and how does that impact our, our daily life. And today is a, it's a great, it's a treat. It's the first one and I chatted with David Callahan. He's an actor, he's a coach and uh, he's a, overall a great, great person and a friend. And I think you're going to love the chat, especially because it's very, uh, it's full of stories from his experience, from his life, uh, from uh, all the way from his childhood to uh, just a few days ago. And through these stories, he is incredibly good at sharing how the fact that he has a clearer understanding of life is turning every day for him into a, a wonderful experience. So I just really, really invite you to, to follow and listen to this chat. And uh, uh, before closing, I just wanted to point out that uh, Daniel and I, we just launched the Campfire at the Edge of the World. And this is a program we are in love with. It's something we really care about. It's very new. And the idea is that through webinars, access to, to courses of video lessons and live Facebook group, the idea is to have this kind of conversations, kind of like what I had with David here, all together in group form and also uh, on your own as you watch the videos. And the idea is that if you could get a little deeper glimpse on who you really are, we could all kind of benefit from it and, and your impact, your life will get richer and fuller. And overall, we see the campfire as a virtual space where people like you and I, people who want to express themselves even more fully and uh, walk on more solid ground, right? Have an experience of life where they can feel stronger on their feet so that they know they can face anything. You know, they can face the great unknowns of, of, of life. We wonder rather than we fear. So I encourage you to check out the page too. I'm going to put the link at the end. But uh, for now, enjoy the conversation and listen to, to what David has to share because it's, uh, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful um, chat. See you later. Bye-bye. Hey, this is something I actually ask really you know, in all the these interviews that I'm having and I kind of say can you give me like a little one, one or two minutes of you know who's David where are you at you know what's what's current for you and you know just a little taste of and a feel of who's David at the moment uh well I'm American I've lived in Milan for 17 years um, and for the last uh, 12 years, I've been working exclusively as an actor and a voice actor and a coach. Um, and the, I, I used to teach at, a, at an, at an acting academy in Milan for many years. Uh, I left the academy as I saw the academy wasn't going in the direction I wanted it to. And I went out on my own and going out on my own. Uh, when I left the academy, I wanted to kind of leave the world of acting and teaching acting and all that business because I had a bad taste in my mouth mm. with, with the experience there. Uh, uh, and I wanted to go out into the world as a coach because coaching is something I started doing at the acting Academy because I had to organize public speaking courses okay. uh, through the Academy. And through this, I came upon the three principles in London, which had a very big impact on my life. And uh, I know you're familiar with the three principles. Is that something that the other people you're interviewing are familiar with? Uh, not necessarily. Not necessarily. Uh, it's not, no. Okay. 
uh, well, basically the the encounter with the three principles, the encounter I had, which I believe is a similar story with many people, you might go there because you're looking for new tools or something about new things you can do for your own work life, in your own work life, how to create more work perhaps. Yeah. But what happens, uh, what happens when I learned about the three principles, which is this, uh, this knowledge about the way we, about the brain works, what actually happened was I just went away from this uh, seminar in London with such a great feeling, feeling so refreshed and feeling so kind of uh, just refreshed, cleaned, yeah. out, cleaned out psychologically, but without having done a thing. It's just <laughs> yes, up, I know waking it. up, waking up one day and feeling terrific. So, Funny enough, this was in twenty. This was in twenty thirteen, um, when I was already I was already working here as an actor. I was teaching acting, but again, more I, I really wanted to go in this direction of coaching, doing something else, getting away from the whole world of, of acting and teaching acting. And instead, this great feeling just kind of spontaneously took me to live my life in a very spontaneous and open manner, which just happened to the effect was that I happened to have gotten much more work. And uh, as a coach or in general, so as an actor? The, no, thanks for asking. Very much in general, very much as an actor. So the fact that I, I would have so much interesting work coming in as an actor or uh, through voice work, which I love. And that for me, that's very definitely acting work so much work would come in, I would have to kind of wake myself up every few weeks and say, oh, wow, well, maybe I should, you know, look for something in the coaching world <laughs> or make something happen here. But uh, so it was, uh, I can't say the full 100% sense of refreshment remained, but there was definitely a kind of recalibrating within me that, that made me much calmer, much more fluid, in in my in my professional life and in my dealings with people that just led to to more and more work and what i'm living now is a com is a combination of all of them and my and coaching is a very satisfying aspect of this to to meet people and to share what my experiences have been professionally since having come into contact myself with the three principles uh and then to be able to share that with other people and uh and hopefully in, uh, inspire other people to see for themselves how they might possibly live in an easier way. And an easier way is actually a more productive way. I think we, uh, among the many false ideas we have in our heads, we have the idea that, oh, I'm not doing enough and I'm not, I'm not doing enough. I'm not concentrating here. I'm not putting on my alarm and getting up and doing this, 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 and making these calls and doing these things. You know, uh, I find... I found uh, in my own life that the more the more I relax and the more I uh, I the more things happen spontaneously. It almost feels like they're coming to me. I'm not going to all of them. I love that. I, I particularly related at the beginning where you were saying, you know, kind of you went there to sort of maybe look for tools and like the missing. Give me something, and I'm gonna be a better coach and make more money and whatever. And because uh, in a way, not with an event, but like. That's how I stumbled upon this understanding as well. And it was with, a, first of all, the first thing I read was a book from Michael Neal, mm -hmm. uh, the, the Inside Out Revolution. And actually the funny thing is the first time I read it, because I read it with that mindset of like, all right, but what are the strategies, you know? Yes. I kind of, I read it, it's like, okay. Like there were a few interesting things, like something, more, but all right, I kind of set it aside. But then, uh, in my case, was listening to a story, again, an audio from Michael Neal, by chance, like months later. And I, I didn't make much of it. I liked it. And then I stopped. And then I was in, I remember being in my bed. It was a period. It was very stressful for me. And that's what I was like, there is something strange here. Like, what's up? They, I, you know, I couldn't get it at the beginning. Then I realized, oh my God, that tightness in my stomach, it's just gone. Like I realized I was just in my bed, like, ah. you know, with that feeling there. And of course I got curious and I was like, oh, you know, then I, I, I found out 
Gary Kramer, and I go, went back to reread the books, and then of course I, I went on. But, but I, I could totally relate with the feeling, and I yes. think I love it because you know, in a way, it's it's yes, it's an understanding of how life works, but in a way that is not conceptual. Like it can become conceptual as everything. Yes. But I think the true power of, of this conversation is, is the feeling behind it. Because that's really has all the information. Undeniably. And and that that's a sticky territory I find to get into as a coach, and particularly yeah. when you're when you're talking to businesses, because when you start to talk about feeling, uh you know, there are, if you are business people where you do have the mindset of, okay, I'm paying you for this hour and a half to give me this new information that's going to let me, uh, let me live better. Yeah. When you talk about feelings, they think you're getting into wishy-washy kind yes, of absolutely. Uh, soft skill territory, but beautiful what you said about lying in bed and that, that tightness in my stomach was gone. That physical concrete sensation of tightness in your stomach the realizing that when we feel that tightening, which is a physical sensation, if you are, if you are, if you're self-aware enough to pick up on those things, but of course, tightness in the stomach is, is something all human beings experience. If you, if you can grasp that it is your thinking that is producing that tightening, and more of all, where the where the new tool comes in, if you understand what that tightening feeling is. And if you concretely understand that a tightening in your stomach is a kind of limiting of your capabilities as a human being, that is a helpful realization. If you can live less than that, you know, there's a, there's the metaphor going around three principles about the, the tea bags, tea bag thought. I don't know this one. It, uh, I, I heard it many times, but it took me a while to really actually appreciate the full metaphor of it that thoughts are like tea bags. They're, they're kind of, as a million thoughts pass through our minds at, at any moment, uh, good thoughts, bad thoughts, funny thoughts, strange thoughts, memories, it's all thought. And they're all passing by like, like tea bags on a conveyor belt being held up by their little tickets. You see the tea bag. Only the tea bags that you actually choose to make tea with which would be a thought that pops by that you don't just let pass by like a bird in a window but a thought that you actually stick with and actually explore it. So you've got this initial thought and then that takes you here, that takes you there. You kind of drill down on that thought. Drilling down on that thought, which is capturing something in your head and actually going there, thinking about it, taking that train, is like making tea with that tea bag. And what you have is tea that is, again, you take this, this original thing that appears, you add consciousness to it, which would be the hot water, and then you've got this experience brewed there. It, it, it's got uh, there are, there are things to experience in it. There's the smell, there's the heat. You have created tea. You spend time with that tea. You either drink it or you leave it there until it gets cold and you get rid of it, but you're creating something out of that. But while you are doing all this, when you are drilling down into something, you're staying in one place and you're missing many other possible thoughts that could have gone by you're drilling down, you're remaining there, which would be remaining in that feeling of the tight stomach, is kind of closing your aperture, aperture and keeping you from seeing so much more of what's happening in life or thinking you or keeping you from coming up with new helpful insights for whatever you're in. So there's something really, uh, th there is the, uh, th th there's the essential egoism that is about suffering in your own thought world. You're kind of either with yourself when you're in the thought world or you're with it all. And aren't you going to be much more effective if you're with it all? Because you're capable of seeing other things. You're capable of seeing other people in front of you. And I often coach for communication and presence. That's largely what I do when I go to companies and in, when I uh, teach at Bacon University. And the concept of, of communication is fully about presence. You cannot just be drilling down in your own world just with your message. There has to be a kind of circular flow of a taking, a constant intake while, while you're giving in communication. 
I, I love that and I, especially the idea because that's something that I, I find myself also kind of expressing it in these terms too, this idea of like making you know your work gets bigger really right the, the more you sort of actually the less time you sort of spend in with the tea the bigger the world right the more the, the opportunities and I have a, a question because you were saying um, you know as I spend more time in that feeling I notice more work coming mm -hmm. to me now because as I said this is not you know it doesn't want to be a tree principle specific thing so you know my, people who listen are not necessarily uh, interested or knowledgeable about the details. Yes. But I think, at least in my experience, that a question that might pop is, okay, but like, it, I think we often experience being spontaneous, living, doing what really kind of feels right in the moment with yeah, but then I'm just going to be on the couch all day and not doing anything of my life. And then on the other side, we see this apparent dichotomy where on the other side there is, I make myself do things and I'm effective and I'm efficient, right? But you said something. So actually, by being spontaneous, I found myself being more efficient, more effective in what I was doing. It had more impact. So uh, how, what do you make of that? Like, did you ever experience it as a opposition? and have you solved it? Like, what's your point of view there? Well, I, I, they, in, in the world of three principles, they talk often about, there, there is often this question. Oh, well, if, if I don't have to do anything, then I'll just be on the sofa. All. And I think this understanding, I don't have to do anything or I have to do less. The, the, the doing less that they're talking about is you have to, do less going out into the world in your own life to find, to purposely find those keys to liberate your life, to change yourself. That's the doing to do less of. The, the, the kind of living in, the, in that not drilling down in your own specific world way, but this kind of open aperture way where you are seeing more of what's happening out there. So you're seeing more opportunity. That means that is energizing. That is, you know, expanding the range of the possible things you could be doing. The sitting on the, the relaxing on the sofa is a possibility in the range of things to do, which might be a great thing for someone to do who perhaps is going 24 seven and needs a relax. But in general, the, but relaxing on the sofa can also be the kind that you described with the tightness in your stomach. You feel kind of intimidated by all of that that's going on or all of that possibility. And it's a kind of depression that makes you immobile. The kind of fresh awakening I'm talking about is something that energizes. And being on the sofa would just be one choice of many, but because you actually want to rest and take time out. It does, does that answer your question? It, it does. And what I'm hearing is that really in a way again the answer is in the feeling as in when we talk about it we can go on forever and say yeah well but you know yes. i i couldn't get there if i didn't send my mind to it but what i noticed because of course experiencing it you get it so because what you said is like the feeling i'm talking about is refreshing and i think once we actually allow ourselves to like relax into this feeling then it's obvious that it's like i of course i wouldn't spend all my life on the car with this with this energy this beauty this you know yeah, energy that is living me right now i it wouldn't even occur to me that this yes. could be a bad thing you know what i mean like so it, it goes back into kind of get out of our head and, and just experience life living us um, what do you, because as I said, one of the themes that we're exploring with this is wonder, mm -hmm. curiosity, right? And I feel it, I feel it's very uh, connected to what we were saying, because in a way, living spontaneously is a little bit uh, a living that is guided by curiosity in the moment, right? It's sort of like following my inclinations in the moment, right? I kind of huh, I wonder what's there. Or like, yes. is this opening? 
So how would you define, what's your experience of wonder? And do you, like, is it present in your life? Is it something that you notice is something you have to work on? It's innate, like, what, what do you see around wonder and curiosity? One, uh, well, fresh back from New York City, a story that comes to mind that I think talks directly to this is the way I felt when I went back to New York. I've lived in New York for many, many years. I, when people ask me to describe New York or what I miss from New York, it's often that sense of living on the streets as you don't really do in, in Milan. It's that being out all the time among so many people in, in such an energetic environment. And when I was in New York, I found myself walking. You know, your, our phones count a number of steps per day. I walked for 19 kilometers the first day I was in New York without even thinking about it, in a state of pure wonder. I never wanted to go down on the underground. And my biggest joy was just talking to every single person I encounter. Little tiny relationships in just buying a coffee. And of course, the girl happens to be from Bergamo, who's making the coffee. <laughs> of course. <laughs> of course. Um, asking, asking two ladies coming down, uh, passing me on the street, if I have to turn, where the, uh, the one and the nine train is, do I, is it on, or is it on that avenue or is it on this avenue? Do I turn right or do I turn left? And during that conversation, another person comes and adds his two cents and then even chased me down the street to suggest that I not enter at this street, but at the next street, because if so, I'd have to walk a long time underground, which I appreciated for his, you know, gratuitous helpfulness. So, uh, living in a state of, so there's a, it's, living in a childlike way, it's living, uh, waiting to be impressed, but that sounds like a doing something. It's like seeing things for the first time, which is what New York made me feel like. I would, I would turn a corner or uh, come out of a subway the few times I took it and not recognize a, a square I was in because all of the buildings would have changed except maybe the statue remains the same. So there was this state of, th this sense of newness of it all. And I found myself, uh, I think I maybe even said it to someone when I was in New York, ah, what a shame I can't enjoy Milan like this. And the, almost the minute the words came out of my mouth, I thought, well, what can't you enjoy in Milan like this? Because again, this thing that was so thrilling to me on this vacation was this in, these fresh new encounters with people I'd never met and every day, I felt like I could take out a, a notebook and write down short stories of these little encounters with completely different okay. people. And I thought, so is this, and like so many times I come up into, oh, well, that was just my thought. And there was no truth in that thought. That was just a thought. But that thought was creating my reality about what I assumed Milan might be. And I came back here and I treated the, the guy making my coffee at the bar in the corner or the lady in the post office, my accountant, I started to treat Even them, your accountant. I started to treat them the way it, it was something that changed in me. I, I was dealing with them the way I was dealing with those people in New York. And it was like that, that beautiful feeling I had in New York city, I brought back to Milan with me. And that was just another of, thousands of examples in my life when I re when there is something that I just assume is fact that I that is actually not fact at all it's my thought and that my thought is coloring this quadrant of my life and it only takes a change in that thought that everything changes completely before you and to recognize that kind of thing and to realize that applies everywhere that is huge that's liberating. That's inspiring. That is possibility is possible. <laughs> possibility is not something that you'll maybe get if you can get enough money and take that time off work, or if you can do this course that's right, or if you meet that perfect person, or if you can finally redo the plumbing in your kitchen or whatever those reasons are. If you go to the gym, if you lose 10 pounds, if you possibility is right here. And that's the thing that makes you relax in your chest to know the possibility is here. And that sensation comes and goes. But once you've really seen the truth in that, 
it's something you're going to miss when you don't have it. You're going to desire getting back to it. But then with your knowledge that things are fluid and go up and down, you're also not going to freak out when you're not feeling like that. And no, I don't feel like that every day. It, it's uh, it's uh, yesterday I was sharing in a, in a session, like uh, to me, one day I was in a conversation with, uh, with Daniel and my insight, <laughs> it was about an event where I wanted to go and it was, uh, I was invited and it was a pizza evening, as you know, here it's quite common. And I used to like, yeah, but I don't want to go because if I have to go there, I have to make connection and create clients and like, you know, because, of, and I just was like, <sighs> and I was talking and really at a certain point, as we talk, the, the thing that clicks to me is like, oh my God, are you saying that I can go to the pizzeria and just have a pizza? <laughs> and I like literally just do that and enjoy that. And, the, and it seems so simple sometimes, you know, like, are you saying I can go even in Milan, I can get a coffee and like greet the, the, the lady, yeah, you know, it's, it, it might sound such simple realizations, but, but somehow it changed that because I think that's, as you said, where all our weight and tightness comes from, from a lot of, you know, a, a bunch of these ideas. Oh yeah, well, I can't possibly do that. And like, you know, Milan is like that. And you know, if you go to that event, you need to milk it, you know, and get more. Work... Yes. And it's insane how many of this we carry with us. And, and it's interesting, your biggest reaction was when I said with my accountant. <laughs> and I imagine you said that because like with me, usually going to visit my accountant is going with this tightness in my chest, just preparing myself for whatever the, the new <laughs> bureaucratic nightmare is going to be that month. But I realized as I was sitting in front of my accountant, and he, because our face-to-face -face encounters are very few, and he's also a friend, or I knew him, I was an acquaintance with him, so he became my accountant, we've become friends as, in this relationship together, but we always have those first few minutes of just, you know, chatting, how was your summer, whatever which I know you, because I always go in there with my agenda, the things I have to ask, the things I have to clarify and the things I have to prepare myself for being terrified of. As we were having that initial chat, I just looking at his face, I realized I was looking at him like a friend, like another person without that whole construct around him of my accountant who's going to ruin my life. He was a human being like I am. And that sensation of looking at some, at looking at the people around you and seeing in them a human being like you are is again immensely powerful. And that means when you go to, you know, when you work with the CEO of a company or with the president of a university or a multimillionaire or a famous person the ability to see the person in front of you as a human being like you. Yeah. And th that was another, that was an insight I had actually when I was in New York, you know, meeting, you know, from in New York, literally you meet A to Z passing on the same street, you know, you know, some fabulous woman dripping in Prada and pearls right next to a homeless man who hasn't changed his clothes maybe in a month, begging in a paper cup. And in New York, I had this almost tingling sensation of looking at people and being like, oh, yeah, that's me. Like, put myself inside of that whole package and circumstance. That's me. Oh, that's me. That's me over there. I love that. That's a, that's a nice thing. And not from only a groovy kind of point of view. You know, this isn't somebody who had taken some drug to feel this way. This is, you know, afternoon sobriety, like new feeling, new realization, not me drilling down on a thought. I wasn't trying to feel this. I was looking around and felt myself smiling like an idiot almost. And you, wow, yeah, because I'm seeing this new thing. It came to me, th this idea. And to think of that outside the context of, oh, a nice feeling I had when I was on vacation, you know, come back into the city, come back into your work life is not that kind of perception 
not so much more effective if you are a boss, if you're an employee, a mother, a friend, a client. And it's not making you soft. It is opening you to so much more possibility of figuring things out, of understanding the other side of the story, of appreciating where the person's coming from, of having a new idea about how that might be helped. And our way of working as human beings, unfortunately, in so many cases, is we are going in with our agenda in every circumstance that it is impossible to hear what another person is saying. Impossible. I, um, part of the image of like seeing yourself, you know, in every human being, I mean, th this idea of actually, I love the image that you were describing in New York and, and also the idea of talking to a person, not to their job description, you know, to their role. Because there's a difference in, I am in a conversation with Paul, or I am in a conversation with the CEO of uh, the big company. Just yes. you're talking to, 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 in one case, you're talking to a person, the other you're talking with that, to an idea. I'm just kind of intimidating. And uh, on this um, subject, like what Gary Kramer um, told me was, What's more practical than knowing yourself, knowing who you are, knowing what's really possible? Because that's what I'm hearing you saying. It's like, it's things that people might say, yeah, well, okay, great. I don't have time for a good feeling now. You know, I have the bottom line to, to look after. Yeah. I, have, I have the bills to pay. But, but honestly, what's more practical than being fully present to, to all that's possible, to be, yes. comp you know? And it's so simple yet i still think so hard to see right because we i you know we hear that oh yeah of course okay yeah but still i have to pay the bills you know like okay, i don't have time now and it's just always fascinating how heavy that conditioning that thinking you know, how much time we spend with it. So it's, it's so real. So I, I get it. And it's interesting what you said. At first you said about the concept of speaking to the person and not to the job title. And then you said, uh, Gary Kramer was talking about the importance of knowing the self. So it is, it's an interesting thing we're talking about here because it's like, it's other centered, but if you lose yourself, you're in, dangerous territory as well yeah. like the talking to the job description that there's a great coach mads quist who gave a brilliant webinar about coaching with businesses and mads was talking about which i think you're addressing here when you say talking speaking to a, a, a position a job title we find ourselves either as coaches or in our business lives kind of adjusting ourselves to kind of be for them what they want to hear so if we're talking to the business person, you've got this thing about, in my case, you know, I'm, they see me on television and, or something. I'm doing my, I'm on this uh, reality show. I'm an actor. They know I'm an actor. And I go in and I've got my actorly voice. And, you know, do I go in there and try to make myself not who I am, not this actor? Am I going to try to, you know, put on my David's business face now? No, because that's going to be so unconvincing. It's, it really comes from a, uh, it starts from, uh, from self-knowledge and then notwithstanding the differences, seeing, uh, seeing that you are the same as other people. And actually, if I could tell a little story about this. Please, a story like about stories. This, because, uh, God, the thing that drove me mad when I first went to, uh, went to London was to hear people just get up and tell their personal stories that were extraordinary. You know, the, the psychologist who was ready to commit suicide was planning her own suicide. <laughs> before she encountered three principles because she was so fed up with her job or but um uh i'm a gay man and growing up gay in america in the 1970s and early 1980s in this lovely very happy happily the, the family of a very happily married couple 
classic kind of photograph of 1944. She was a nurse, he was a soldier, that kind of a thing. Uh, you know, professional people, middle class, very happy, church going family every weekend. And I was a very precocious child and knew from a very young age that I was gay, but gay wasn't even on the radar screen in 1970s America. Not on the radar screen. You know, everything everywhere was the American family, like Molino, what is it, Molino Bianco? Molino Advertise. Bianco, yeah. Like Molino Bianco advertising. That, that was America, all of it. You know, the, the American family, the boy and the girl, the happily married parents, everybody smiling with white teeth. And it didn't even compute that as, as a 10-year-old, I was living with this weight of, I don't fit into any of these pictures. And worse than that, because I had no other information from anywhere, I had this constant tightness in my chest about thinking, what is my future going to be? I'm not going to have a family. I'm not going to have a wife. What am I going to do for work? Where am I going to, what world is going to be for me? I had, I was burdened with these thoughts as, as a gay child that, that rendered my entire life incredibly heavy. And I was bullied like mad in school. I had a very high, very sissy voice. I spoke like my mother. I was bullied terribly in school to the point where I was avoiding like I was afraid of church because I was afraid of maybe meeting parents whose children went to school with me and knew that I was the sissy boy, or I was just th this thing over my head uh, of who I was and where I was going to go and being ostracized by society before I even came out as homosexual. I was just sissy boy, but in my mind, it was all one ball of wax. So I was a really paranoid, drilling down individual. And when I finally came out to my parents, my very evolved, very spontaneous father, who comes from wisdom and mind and not from drilling down. When I told my parents I was gay, my father paused and he said to me, you know, you've waited 22 years to tell us this. Were you 22? I was 22. He said, you've waited 22 years to tell us this. This makes me believe that you waited so long because somewhere in your mind you assumed that I would have loved you less had I known this and for wow. that and for that reason that probably inspired that weight I I I ask for your forgiveness I apologize wow wow is is right it was an extraordinary moment an extraordinary moment. And that was very beautiful. And that inspired in me, you know, a great, wow, I'm actually okay as a human being. And, uh, and I can be loved even if people know this thing. And so I just threw like a sandbag over a hot air balloon. I just threw that thought that I am essentially not right. <laughs> but unfortunately, a kind of new thought came into my head from that moment that was another erroneous thought and extremely, uh, that kind of made me arrogant. It kind of took me from complete uh, terror and closure to a kind of aggressive explosion in which I, I, resented the fact that I had wasted so much of my youth mm. living in paranoia. And I kind of had this assumption that, well, if I've paid so much in suffering in my youth, the world kind of owes me a living now. And it put a kind of arrogant chip on my shoulder. And of course, an arrogant chip is defensiveness. It's just, an, it was another form of defensiveness. It wasn't a closed kind of defensiveness. It was a kind of yeah. aggressive defensiveness. And I lived in that for a while, but the worst part of that, to go back to what we were talking about before, about identifying, my, identifying myself with people, the worst part of that arrogance was seeing the world so much through my own eyes that I saw the only real essential point of suffering in the world is suffering if you are homosexual in a world that's against it. 
And I found myself having no empathy for any other kinds of pain or problems. My sister's issues in their lives or with their children or with their husbands or in their professional lives or health problems or anything. I, I had this thought in my head like, well, you don't, you don't have to deal with what, I'm, what I have to deal with, so that's not real. And that created so much distance for me before I had the new realization that I can't say was completely inspired by the three principles because the three principles at the end of the day is just telling you the way we work. And the way we work is the way we're working. And the three principles were working through me in my life. They were helping me to get where I was. But it was also all around in that moment and having these new ideas like, that's a wrong idea too. And actually, that kind of insecurity I felt is experienced by everyone. But in different ways, different contexts, but that essential sense of feeling a human being, feeling essentially broken, feeling essentially outside, feeling essentially apart from, that kind of separation I felt that I only put in the camp of the fact that I was homosexual, that exists for everyone. And that was a huge lightning and realization. And that is why to see the truth of it all, that we are only living within our conceptualized version of everything, of ourselves, of our partners, of our city, of our you know, professional life or social standing. We are living only in our conceptual, conceptualized box of everything, which means that everything can have its secret that's going to show itself that day. Like Milan had its secret last week when I returned from New York that showed itself that day, that Milan is just as fabulous, fabulous and kaleidoscopically fascinating as New York City. Isn't that beautiful, right? To see like that kind of like the idea of like, okay, I wonder, you know, which box is going to open today, you know, and what surprise is going to come up. Like right? it's kind of, it's the, uh, well, first of all, thanks for sharing the, the story. I, I mean, it was powerful. And like, I, I think what your father told you is an example that you don't need to go and study the three principles, you know, for, for, to live from that place. It's there, it's in us, as you said. Yeah. Um, it's just that we forget. And I guess knowing our works kind of help to reconnect, but it's there whether we study it or not. And yeah. I, I think that is also beautiful. And one thing, when you were saying about realizing that that feeling of separation of uh, anxiety or misunderstood, being misunderstood and things like that are actually something we all explore. And don't you, I mean, I find it so beautiful in a way that somehow even it, like, that feeling of separation that we might experience is actually what's uniting us hmm. to all. Like we are in a way, one day, I, I don't know, I'm curious to, to hear what, what you think about it. But one day I found myself, I was driving and I just thought how funny it is that the deepest part in me, right? That feeling I have in my stomach that you can, you know, I can hide from you. I can, it's probably the part that nobody's ever going to really see is also the thing that connects me to all us because we all have it, mm. right? That well, Because I think in a way, the idea of that's only happening to us and nobody can understand, it's, is that thought that keeps us distant. And as you said, the more you realize, wow, this I'm going through is really the same, just with different circumstances. But it really is like this very same feeling, like I actually know exactly what I'm going through. They, they absolutely know it. We all do. Yeah. So it's so funny, like the secret is, the deepest part of us is also the most common thing that would actually unite us. Mm -hmm. And that regardless how you live, the possibility is always there or how you have lived. I think, you know, as an actor, the, those cathartic moments that we all know so well, the times that we have wept in a cinema, 
hopefully we've all wept in a cinema at some point, those cathartic moments of when, you know, the most hardened person who on the deathbed or, you know, before the death of the child or in those climax mm -hmm. moments where they have, the fact that we are able to, to weep at that, to identify with that, and who knows if we're weeping at it because we're seeing ourselves in that, like how hard am I that I'm not able to get there? Or we see that coming up in art depicted all the time mm -hmm. as a possibility. So we know that it's true. And that's why it's so deeply affecting. Yeah, because we recognize it. You know, yes. You know? And it's also ultimately, if you take the church out of the equation, <laughs> as in the actual church and the men that have created the church, it's, it's what scripture talks about as well. You know, the Psalms of, of, of the Bible, the things that Jesus says in the New Testament are all about that. It's like, you know, I know you suffer but there's something bigger. You're all suffering and you're all okay. You're all loved. It's the, it's the exact same message. Sidney Banks, the father of the three principles said that all the time, that there's so much truth everywhere and you'll start to see that truth everywhere. And that doesn't mean if you start to do three principles, you have to start going to church. Maybe what you experience in church is going to be more real or everything can become more real. And those insights can be in any corner. Yeah, because eventually those are all ways of pointing, whether it's a song, a movie, or the three principal course. It, it, there's a ways of pointing us to what's already true in us, what we know. Yes. But if it's about relaxing to like, huh, no, really, you know, I, I, I am okay. And uh, yeah, like to, to sort of wrap up, what, one thing I wanted to ask you is because I was listening, right? And I said, okay wow, you know, isn't that beautiful? No, you are in that place of clarity and, you know, you can live as a Christmas morning every day wondering is, what's going to wrap? Is it, the, is it the, yeah. you know, is it going to be the city that's going to change? Is it going to be the partner that's going to be, you know, what new opportunity, this sort of wonderland, right? And I do recognize that feeling, right? But then I also wonder, okay, but, you know what i am I not st still seeing like you know this is beautiful but probably i assume we you know we, we didn't you never arrive I, you never okay well fine now i'm complete so in your case right now what are you curious about where you have a sense if you had to and of course we don't know but if you had to say what's your sense of what could be the next box opening up for you Well, well, the first thought that comes into my mind is I'm thinking if you would say something like that to Sid Banks, like, yeah, this feels great, but what am I, but what greatness am I not getting? I would think Sid Banks would just say, Headbutt. oh, <laughs> stop mentally masturbating and go walk on the beach. <laughs> or, you know, you know, the, the famous Sid Banks thing about if you're listening to one of my if you're listening to yes. a recording of me, throw it out the window. And if you're finding yourself in that feeling, just, yeah. What would seem to me so silly, like, why would I do that? If I've learned something in that, wouldn't I want to go on and listen to the whole tape? Sid's point is, that's the point. Yeah. Life in the present moment is the point. I, I love this. I, I have the, there's this little boy. Uh, he was a little boy. Since he's eight years old, I have coached this boy. He's now 17. Well, wow. this is long before the three principles when I was, I was a tutor for him in English. This kid is now an adult. And because I am our time together, I would say has taken on a more coaching relationship because it's a conversation. Now we go, we talk in English. It has much less to do with correcting grammar now and just talking about things and concepts. And I was at his house yesterday after his vacation and this 17-year-old, beautiful young 17-year-old Italian boy, very intelligent, from a very wealthy family, who is going to go off and study economics at, a, at, a, at Bocconi University. A lot of possibility for this kid. Um, and a lot of rigorousness behind his preparation. And 
we had the most beautiful hour and a half conversation yesterday in which he brought up how how he feels like he's wasting his life because he's spending so much time thinking about his future. Mm. And this is a sensation I've had. Uh, I'm good friends with the mother as well, who very much wants the best for her children and pushes, pushes. I mean, it's all about the summer isn't the summer. The summer is a summer program in, in mm. England to improve your English. That's got to be, you know, in a med school, if you want to become a doctor, it's got to be with a financial group of it. I mean, there is so much pushing and stress on these kids, which I've always felt, and it's always given me a great deal of tenderness. When he came out with this yesterday, it was so beautiful. And he kept talking and he said, you know, I find myself thinking, you know, I'm finally going to be happy when I don't have to take public transport anymore because I'll have a car. Or I'm thinking about, you know, how I'll finally be happy when I'm not living here anymore because I'll have my own apartment, hopefully, you know, if I go to college that's far away. And, and, um, and he was so sincere and describing, I think, the reality of so many people in, in the most ingenuous, true manner. And... I mean, I, you know, and it's, it's only going to be valuable if you come up for it for yourself. So he had already come up with what was useful for himself. This, you know, don't lose now if you're, if you're living in the future and, and um, yeah. And I told him a little bit about my experience in New York and I said to him, I said, you know, I get the same sensation. And I talk, told him about that happy feeling I had in New York and that, sense of attachment and just living in the moment and the things that came up were so entertaining and beautiful to me. And I said, yeah, it's almost like, because this boy has a very serious expression on his face all the time. You know, even when he says hello to you, he's like, you know, ciao, David, you know, come stai. Very kind of Milanese, I would say. And in fact, I, <laughs> and with him, with many clients, I find myself being a bit of a clown because I love to get people to laugh and smile and and of course, he, like everyone, is so much more beautiful when he's laughing and smiling. And I said at a certain point, I said, yeah. I said, it's, it's almost like we're doing a disservice to ourselves and not really living life deeply if we are not just walking around all the time with a kind of silly smile on our faces. All the time. On the tram. What's the glory of public transportation? You know? In this moment, in this moment where you are. It's like I said to him, you know, you're a senior now and you're going out. So, you know, instead of enjoying your full maturity and you're, you know, the, the cock of the walk as the senior in the school. And instead of enjoying this, this, you know, path you've taken and you've done so well and now you're going to go to a good school. It's like instead of enjoying this thing you earned because you're about to step into being the freshman again. You're going to step into the new insecurities of being the new guy and figuring out how it all works. You've spent four years, five years figuring out how it all worked in high school. Enjoy this last year of high school before you go into this new thing that's going to be a whole new set of sensations. It was, it was a beautiful conversation and he, he, very, he taught me a lot yesterday. Well, thanks for sharing this story too. And I agree with you. It's definitely something that probably in, with different circumstances a lot of people, we all from time to time experience. And so to, to wrap up, because I think I was, you know, I'm trying to think, okay, well, I'm listening to these stories, right? And it just feels, you know, the famous feeling, because I think the hearing stories of the kind, again, it's another way, even if we're not talking about mind consciousness, but the, the truth is that we're pointing to something that, we can recognize within ourselves, and therefore we're like, oh yeah, you know, relax a little bit more. So it sounds great, and oh wow, living and possibilities, and you know, the smile, it, it just, it's beautiful. But the the Milanese in me, all right, will say, yeah. okay, that this is great. So how do I do that? Right. And again, yeah, there's nothing to do, but like I think to to that you know role i'm playing now they wouldn't cut it 
you know, now you can't tell me that this is so beautiful. Now you can tell me that there's nothing else to do to do it. Like, I, I want to know. <laughs> How, what's the point there? What would you share with, with someone that said, like, you know, man, like I listen to you and I, I want a bit more of that. How do I do it? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is play more. This, the young man I talked to yesterday, I saw as a child, he used to play so much when I was there, I'd pull my hair out because his mother's paying me a lot of money to teach them English. And I remember at a certain point of puberty even saying to them, boys, don't lose this. You were such crazy, weird, playful, crazy kids. Don't lose that. And in a certain sense, I've seen it. The, the, the conversation he had with me was speaking to this, this kind of rigidity that, that's encrusting him. But so would that be effective to say to a Milanese or to any person who's caught up in their own life to say play more? No, that probably play more in the sense of play more with experience. Because again, the whole point of three principles really for me is your what you are seeing is your boxing off. What you are seeing is your ideas. This, this isn't ethereal, this is real. Yeah. What you think is real is real. Play with the fact that what you think for real is real is just real for you. There are so many more possibilities in everything. In everything. How you have defined your boss or how you've defined your partner is how you've defined them. They are so much richer than that. And I think the beauty is that how you have defined yourself. How, starting my, thank you, starting absolutely from that, how you've defined yourself. That's why, I don't know if it was one of the great coaches of the 3P world who said basically anything you say about yourself is untrue. Or anything you say about yourself is true. But you're much more than that. Because, because you're much more than that. How offensive would it be if you heard me describe you in four points? Say, well, I'm so much more than that. And I'm also this, and I'm times this. And I'm... We are all so much more than that. We are, the human beings are extraordinary, extraordinary people. We see it all the time. You know, the person who lost both legs who end up winning the long jump at the Olympics. The woman whose house was bombed in Kabul and who lost her entire family. And she somehow goes on and maybe she's a lawyer working for human rights at the United Nations now. There are extraordinary stories like that everywhere. And, you know, those stories are also frustrating. Like, yeah, they've gotten over this. I can't even get over the fact that I don't have enough money in my account this month. Or all of our, yeah, that's part of it. There's feeling crappy is universal and is happening. But feeling deliciously joyous is also universal. And it's not happening enough. Forget, there was some of you did a course on refine your, rediscover your joy. And he said the first day somebody was like, rediscovered, I've never had it. <laughs> you know, yeah. the, we, we can say uh, objectively, these poles exist in the human experience for everybody. Great joy and great insecurity and misery. We, you know, how are we living that whole range? We've all got the bad stuff in the insecurity moments. How are we living the whole range also up to joy? It would just be kind of, the, the British have that beautiful expression, you've got your head up your ass, your head up your own ass. We didn't have it in America, but it's a great expression. It's like, pull your head out of your own ass and see the world around you. Sounds, sounds like good advice. <laughs> and, the, and the truth of the matter is, when we're down, we can't see anything that's to be taken as fact so don't think about don't organize your life and whatnot when you're down 
Don't drill into those tea bags when you're down. When you're down, you're down. Accept that you were in a place where your mind is not working properly. Don't, don't make decisions there about your relationship, about anything. Don't make your relation, don't make your decisions when you're there. So, you know, play, play with that full range of experience. And what, you know, you know, follow your joy, follow your bliss, you know, what, in what moments do you feel joyful? What makes you feel joyful? How do you bring more of that into your life, that thing, that event? Yeah, I think it's, it's uh, the idea is really what if, you know, to be open, at least again, what I heard is, you know, be open to the possibility that there is much more than what you're thinking, than what you're seeing, that you're experiencing at the moment. I think that is probably, yeah, it's, that's the that's the most important step to be open to start considering for real like what if there is more to this than what i see and yeah i love the idea of exploration right so like play with it as you say you know when, when i hear players like go explore try you know yeah. take things because uh, you know we we recently created this uh, group the we called it a campfire at the edge of the world mm. Right, and the idea is really kind of this place where we can all get together and, and share stories about, and, and help each other get to the edges of, as you said, of this sort of world we build for ourselves. And kind of let's go and look because there is more. Let's see how that looks like. Because yeah. it's fun, right? And not because that's gonna save your life, just because it's fun, right? Yeah. David, I thank you so much for the. Um, what is called? Is there anything that you say like, yeah, I, I would like, you know, anything else that's coming up that you would like to share? Or um, you think you were complete? Are there some final words of wisdom from you? Uh, you shared with us so many already. Uh, uh, yeah, one word, patience. Hmm. At the wedding I just went to, they had this thing on the dance floor where they invited all the couples and then they sent the couples away according to how long they'd been married. And the last remaining dancing couple was my parents who've been together for over 60 years. And at the end, the disc jockey said to my dad, so what's the key to a happy relationship? And my dad said, one word, patience. <laughs> <laughs> And we know my dad's wise. Exactly. I would trust the wise man. <laughs> so be, be patient because, you know, you know, the, the, you can watch, you can, you can watch a webinar like this and maybe feel inspired by it, or you can watch a webinar like this and just kind of think, Oh, screw them. And they're flighty, whatever. My life stinks. And it's di life is like that in many points. Patience is, you know, be patient that if you don't do anything now while you're in this murky soup, be patient that things change. That's the only guarantee. Things will change. And things keep changing like this. So be patient. Be patient. Yes. Michael Neal says, you know, success is staying in the game long enough to get lucky. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, yeah. And thank you so much. This has been a thank real... You. It was uh, fantastic to talk to you and uh, yes, 